I'm just curious for my own curiosity as someone who aspires to do what you do, how, how did you avoid being pigeonholed as a journalist and how were you able to make that leap into, into TV and film? One thing that, um, that TV producers often like is the idea of writers who have experience in other worlds and therefore can bring, bring to bear to the television world. A lot of writing is the same regardless of genre. The sense of structure, the sense of how do you uh, get an audience's attention and maintain it, those things are the same. And so it's a transition that is not easy, but is in many ways not as difficult as you might think. Hello, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Lolas Eric Ellie. I am so excited to talk to him. He's an award-winning journalist, documentary filmmaker, screenwriter, and cookbook author. His credits include story editor on HBO's Treme and AMC's Hell on Wheels. His books include Smokestack, Adventures in the Heart of Barbecue Country. In this conversation, we talk about Creole cuisine, the culture of New Orleans and Louisiana, which is a subject close to my heart because according to family lore, I have roots in Louisiana, and that's where my last name, Borne, comes from. I consider Mr. Ellie a kindred spirit. I've had a similar career path and I aspire to the type of success that he's had. And also in our conversation, we talk about how Mr. Ellie made the leap from journalist to screenwriter. So I hope you get a lot out of this conversation, as much enjoyment as I did. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Lolas Eric Ellie. One thing I was really curious about is there's so many aspects of Louisiana and New Orleans, and I'm from up north, so I say New Orleans. <laughs> so, so many aspects of Louisiana and New Orleans culture. What interested you in um, focusing on the cuisine of the region? Well, a friend of mine uh, named Rudy Lombard wrote a book in 1978 entitled Creole Feast. Okay. 15 master chefs in New Orleans revealed their secrets. And in that book, he said that everything interesting about New Orleans could be attributed to Black people. Okay. And he could make that case with architecture and music. He felt it to be true with food, but he couldn't make the case. He didn't really know. Okay. So he found a great chef at the time, Nathaniel Burton, and the two of them wrote this book exploring that. Mm -hmm. What was interesting to me about that is he first raised the question of the African-American contribution to Creole food. He also raised the question of what Creole food was. And if you look at almost all of the cookbooks about Creole food, they really emphasize the French. And then they talk about all the other white people who ever passed through Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And having been, at that point, having been to, to West Africa, I'm like, this food tastes a whole lot more West African than French to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to explore in my own work. Right. And um, so if somebody was new, you know, to Louisiana or New Orleans, they'd never been there before. What What are some dishes that you would recommend that they sample to get a good, um, you know, hey, no pun intended, good flavor of the region? Yeah. Uh, red beans and rice is probably okay. the most common traditional dish. Jambalaya, gumbo, and po' boy sandwiches. So either fried seafood or even ham and cheese or hot sausage, po' boys. Mm -hmm. uh, beignet. Mm -hmm. um, kala, the fried rice fritters, all those things would give you a good flavor of the city. I guess maybe shrimp remoulade as well. Um, those are kind of the standard dishes. There are some others, obviously, that you will see less frequently. Um, a lot of chicken etouffee or shrimp etouffee, crawfish bisque, boiled seafood, crawfish shrimp or crabs. Um, those are the things that I think are emblematic of the city. Now, I have friends who are Italian and Mexican, and they'll be the first to tell you, like, Olive Garden is not authentic Italian or, you know, name whatever mm -hmm. fast food uh, Mexican chain. That's not authentic Mexican. So how how can, outside of Louisiana, how can you tell if you're getting authentic Creole cuisine? You know, that word authentic is a complicated one. Okay. Um, because I'm wondering whether you're telling me that nobody in Mexico would recognize the food at whatever Taco Bell, and nobody mm -hmm. in Italy would mm -hmm. recognize the food at Olive Garden. And then you also have to ask yourself whether you're more concerned with authentic or good. Now, there's a point when people seem to think that Cajun just meant 
a whole lot of spice. And therefore, if you add a lot of spices, that would automatically be Cajun. Um, but the other thing is that there's a whole lot of New Orleans food in New Orleans that I don't particularly like, or that I don't think represent good versions of these dishes. Gumbo being um, the best example of that, because most of the gumbos in New Orleans are Cajun gumbos, when New Orleans food is Creole, there's a distinction. Okay. Which is not to say that they are bad, but to be honest, I don't think you can really know. Even if you come to New Orleans, you're going to get stuff that's going to say, oh, that's not the way my mama make it. That's kind of like life. Hopefully you find some versions that you like and can then explore how close they are to the originals. Right. So if I go to Popeye's, you know, and get red beans and rice, that may not necessarily be authentic, but you're saying it's sort of like a, maybe an entryway into Creole cuisine? Popeye's red beans are very good. Okay. They do something that I hate, which is use this parboiled rice, which never tastes bad, but never, ever, ever tastes good. Mm -hmm. It's kind of right. crazy because all these Asian chains make good rice and they make, you know, they make millions of pounds of rice a year. But the red beans at Popeye's are very good. As far as the fried chicken, I've heard people say that the fried chicken at Popeye's in New Orleans is better than fried chicken at Popeye's at other places. Okay. I eat Popeye's once or twice a year, so I can't really make that comparison, you know? Right, right. Why do you think Creole food is not more widespread? You know, there's tons of standalone Chinese, Mexican, Italian, name any other, Greek, any other, you know, ethnic food you could name. But why are there not more standalone, you know, Creole restaurants around the United States the way, the way there is with other kinds of ethnic food? Well, mind you, you just listed several countries. Okay. And compared it to arguably the southern half of a state. And so there are a lot fewer people from Louisiana than there are from those other places. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, a lot of those places end up, ended up being started because folks from those countries came here and somebody had to make the food of the country for them. Then other people in the United States said, oh, we like Greek food, we like Mexican food, and it spread in that way. Um, so I think Creole food is, is very different in that regard. The other thing is that at the time of Hurricane Katrina, when damn near everybody ended up evacuating the city after the storm, mm -hmm. they said that Louisiana had more native born residents than any other state, mm -hmm. that we were less apt to move away. Um, which means that there was not that kind of Louisiana diaspora of folks trying to cook Louisiana food. Now, now I'm living in Los Angeles. And it turns out I'm living in a neighborhood that used to be called Little New Orleans. Mm. And there are several New Orleans flavored restaurants uh, within a couple of miles of here. So in that sense, you do see that there are um, there's something of a diaspora in places where there where a lot of New Orleanians have settled. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah, I think you're looking at really um, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, and and uh, the Bay Area of California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting in um, The Warmth of Other Suns, how Isabel Wilkerson described how people, when they were doing the Great Migration, ended up where they ended up because of the train lines and how they ran, they ran and how people from Louisiana ended up primarily on the West Coast and further West in the Mid Coast, like, you, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in the Midwest, like you just uh, explained. Well, Chicago became important. I, I assume that there was a direct train line. I got relatives who moved both to the coast and to Chicago, mm -hmm. but also a lot of the musicians moved to Chicago. King Oliver and Louis Armstrong both moved there, and we're talking about the 1920s. So in that sense, another thing that motivates the decision of where to move is where do you know people? And once you get, you know, 10 of your people in one place, then 20 more will follow, you know? Right, right. So the Creole cuisine of uh, New Orleans or Louisiana, is it different from like the Creole cuisine of Haiti or, you know, any other place where there was French colonized with, with African people? Um, there are definite similarities. For mm -hmm. example, in both New Orleans and in Haiti and the sections of Cuba where Haitians settled, mm -hmm. red beans are standard food. And Cubans are known for black beans. So it's striking to find that similarity with Haitians and red beans. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you often find is that the definition of Creole 
means tomato sauce. Interesting. I was in Puerto Rico and they had shrimp Creole on a menu and it's basically shrimp cooked in a tomato sauce. Mm -hmm. um, whether we're talking about, you know, the French settlement in Madagascar, to the French settlement in West Africa, to the French settlement in the, in the Caribbean, there are some things that are sort of common. Um, I would argue that the, the African element is more important than the French element in terms of the culinary traditions of these places. Um, I got a friend from Cameroon mm -hmm. whose family settled in the Bay Area of California. He started dating a woman from New Orleans and he said tasting New Orleans food was the first time he tasted something in New Orleans in the United States that reminded him of the food of Cameroon. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find that consistently. You know, New Orleans in terms of its French connections, the fine dining tradition is certainly French. There are certain dishes and sauces that are very much French, like uh, the Meniere sauce, and um, uh, like a uh, dish like uh, potatoes, Brabant, um, Hollandaise sauce, which you see in a lot of menus, is obviously French. But I think the African element is really the common denominator in those places. Right. And also, do you think that Americans tend to mix up Cajun and Creole like they don't know the difference? Um, they certainly don't know the difference. And in fact, mm -hmm. most people in Louisiana, I don't think, could articulate the difference well. And there's a good reason for it. We're talking about places that are about two hours apart with modern highways and modern cars. Mm -hmm. If we're going to talk about, um, oh my goodness, maybe I'm on <laughs> a call there. now, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Um, if we're going to talk about what things were like, you know, 80, 100 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, both the train and the, in the, you know, the slower roads and so forth really meant that these places were not very far apart. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the dishes have the same names. Mm -hmm. I make a big distinction between Cajun gumbo and Creole gumbo, but the word gumbo is applied to both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you find people, because of the Cajun craze of the 1980s, you find people coming to New Orleans looking for Cajun food. Right. You find chefs who are not from New Orleans, learning from chefs who are not from New Orleans, learning from chefs who are not from New Orleans. And so in that sense, they think, for example, that andouille is Cajun, is Creole sausage when it's not. Um, but these are the kinds of things that happen when you have this sort of mixing of people and not a real codified uh, definition of what these dishes and recipes should be. Right, right. Do you think, um, you know, shows that you've contributed to in movies like Treme, do they help um, kind of preserve Creole culture and maybe get more people interested in learning more and, and learning about the authentic authenticity and the, you know, the nuances of Creole well, culture and cuisine? Treme very consciously sought to celebrate New Orleans culture. Mm -hmm. And there's an extent to which if you were an elder of the culture, particularly a Mardi Gras Indian or a jazz musician or an R&B musician, if you were old, we wanted to get you on camera. Okay. But in some ways important in that some of these people have since died and there probably is not much other video evidence of their having lived. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, and in particular, we had researchers, we had consultants, we really tried to get it right and accurately. Um, and so the things you can learn by watching Treme, but I think it is more important for, the, for sparking your curiosity than for really um, explaining things to you. Okay, yeah. right. Do you ever watch a movie or a TV show and just kind of cringe like, wow, they got, <laughs> they got it so wrong. They got New Orleans or Creole culture so wrong, all the all the stereotypes and none of the authenticity. I haven't done that in a while. I, you know, mm -hmm. I tend to avoid those shows. Part of the <laughs> problem is that what they really want to do is use the image of New Orleans as somewhere exotic yes. and impose all of their exoticism on it, as opposed to saying, what is there about this place that's intrinsically interesting? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's one show with Larry Hagman, a legal show that thankfully lasted only a season. Or among other things, he talked about uh, alligators as being common house pets in Louisiana. Oh, right. It's like, you know, man, this shit ain't funny. It ain't true. Right, it ain't right. 
why would you say something that's stupid you know right um uh, are you working on any um any projects right now anything that you can you're able to talk about um yeah the main thing that i'm working on now is a tv show about two americans going to um champagne to make champagne mm, wow and so i'm in the middle of of writing the second draft of the script mm -hmm. um hopefully it will be on apple tv plus at some point in the next year or two now i mean i'm sure you can't give away a whole lot of details but are there um black characters involved because i think that's very um innovative to have black characters doing something like that um well black characters and race are very much at the heart of this because as you know the hip-hop community has helped to popularize champagne right so the the uh the setup is that the hip-hop guy is getting a little older so he's trying to figure out what he can do to earn some money other than do music and he wants to have his own private label of champagne he finds uh one american one black american who works at a sparkling wine house in sonoma and so he gets he and his brother to go to france to make champagne for them they get the champagne they find themselves in the middle of a feud between an old champagne maker and a young uh wine grower and so it's very much about the impact of african-american culture on an, ex uh, an exclusive good like champagne so race is very much the subtext of it, uh, although I'm trying to avoid cliches like, you know, um, oh, I've never seen a black person before. It's like, yeah, I don't think you're going to find that. But the other yeah. ways in which race uh, plays out and plays out a subtle and profound. Well, that's awesome. I look forward to seeing that. So do you, how does writing, you know, articles or books where you're basically everything is just coming out of your own head. And I'm sure you know, you'll, you'll have an editor who will give feedback as compared to the collaborative process of uh, television and film. Is, is one more difficult than the other or do you enjoy one more than the other? I'll tell you what's funny. Um, you're sitting in a writer's room mm -hmm. on a TV show trying to figure out how to, to address this point of plot. And you make a suggestion nobody likes and they keep talking and you're saying to yourself, these people are so stupid. Why don't they realize that I've just given them the best possible solution? Right. I'm going to write my own show so I don't have to deal with these idiots. <laughs> you come home and you start working on your own show. You can't figure something out. And you say, man, I wish I had a writer's room where people could help me <laughs> figure this out. Um, I think the hardest thing to do is always the thing you're doing now. And it would seem so much easier if only you didn't have to do this. Um, you know, if only you had a writer's room, if only you didn't have a writer's room. The advantage of, um, of writing essays or articles is that if you're lucky, you won't have a heavy-handed editor. Okay. Or you'll be writing in a book and it's pretty much whatever you decide um, will work. So, um, you know, and I've written... Sometimes you write for a magazine and the magazine has a very clear style and you have to conform to it. Other times they want your voice and you can mm -hmm. write the way you'd like to write it. You know? Right. Just, I'm just curious for my own curiosity as someone who aspires to do what you do, how, how did you avoid being pigeonholed as a journalist and how were you able to make that leap into, into TV and film? Um, there are a fair amount of people who've done it. Um, I got lucky because Eric Obermeyer and David Simon came to Orleans to make Tremaine wanted a writer, mm -hmm. a couple of writers who knew the city. So they got me into that. And then I, you know, I learned some of TV writing from them, but then I moved out to LA and learned a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, um, that TV producers often like is the idea of writers who have experience in other worlds and therefore can bring bring to bear to the television world. Interesting. It can be problematic, particularly when I think about journalism, because I remember on a couple of shows I worked on, you know, trying to have it both ways that, well, it doesn't matter what this newspaper character, newspaper reporter character writes. And on the other hand, it's like, well, if he writes this, it's going to, you know, it's going to blow up the business. It'll be terrible. I think a lot of times 
um, television and movies play fast and loose with the facts yeah. in ways that they don't have to. And that can be frustrating as a journalist. Right, but right. Um, a lot of writing is the same regardless of genre. The sense of structure, the sense of how do you uh, get an audience's attention and maintain it, those things are the same. And so it's a transition that is not easy, but is in many ways not as difficult as you might think. Right, right. What's your sense of the status of Black people in film and television? Are, is, has any progress been made with having more Black people in writers' rooms, and not just writers' rooms, but showrunners and other key positions behind the camera? There's an article, I think, in Deadline a couple of months ago about uh, Black women showrunners. They had mm -hmm. about a half dozen of these women. And so the answer to your question that way is yes. And in fact, there are other things I could tell you, both anecdotally and specifically, I would suggest yes, Black folks are making a lot of progress in this regard. But also, having worked in a couple of different fields, I kind of bristle at that question mm -hmm. because um, I think the fundamental problem is that there are too many Black people who are in jail, who don't finish school for whatever reason, or don't finish uh, graduate school for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, yeah, you could easily get a whole lot more people in writer's room. Just go and rate all the journalism outlets. Get the best and brightest Black folks in journalism. Right. The next year you'd be saying, wow, there ain't no Black folks with any journalism program. <laughs> I think ultimately we need a larger pool and not so much to funnel into any particular field as to funnel into all of the fields, whatever ones they would choose to be a part of. And, and what are some ways that that can happen? Is it mentoring or, um, you know, there are, there are studios and stuff that have diversity programs, but some of them seem like they're, you know, just kind of in name only. What are some ways that that can happen to de develop more talent, develop the talent pipeline? Um, hmm. I think one thing that would help is for colleges and universities in general, and HBCUs in particular, to look at screenwriting as a viable uh, minor or major field of study. Okay. The question is, when you are a college student and you go to whatever the equivalent career day would be, does anybody mention this as a possibility? And so much of what you learn in school is not necessarily geared toward a specific career. But I think more people need to be thinking about this as a possibility for themselves. In terms of what the, um, you know, the, the various guilds and studios could do, um, you know, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have all this media consolidation going on. And when you decide you want to merge with another company, a lot of the point is to cut jobs and programs and save money. So I'm not certain how many of those programs will remain. Certainly fewer studios and networks means fewer of those kinds of opportunities. Right. Um, and a lot of it all is a matter of those of us who are in the field trying to do things to help bring others into it. But that's such an individual decision and such a, an individual relationship decision that it's hard to talk about it. In, in general terms. Right, right, absolutely. Was there anything I didn't ask about that you wanted to mention or anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, well, you you covered a range of things. I mean, we could, a couple of shows that have particularly impressed me that I think deserve a little more recognition. Um, Blind Spotting show, so I think Stars, Okay. I think it's a brilliant show that, that folks aren't really watching as much as they should. Atlanta's getting a lot of a lot of attention, and I think deservedly so. Um, I'm trying to get what other black shows in particular have excited me. Um, those two are the most interesting to me about you know in terms of what's on now. Right. I'm gonna have to check out Blind Spotting. I haven't seen that one. It was based loosely on a movie, which is also good. But they okay. do some very innovative things in television. Also, the stories are not, I don't know, a young writer sent me 
a couple of shorts that he had done and wanted me to look at. And, you know, the climax is always two people yelling at each other. It's like there's all kinds of subtle and profound ways for people to have disagreements or for stories to unfold that did not end up being so um, emotionally typical, you know? Right, right. Well, Mr. Ellie, thanks again for your time. Enjoy okay. talking to you, man. You take care of yourself. Great talking to you. Take care. Right. If you like this video, please leave a comment, share it, and subscribe to my channel.